I'd just like to start by acknowledging the people of the Woi Wurrung and Boon Wurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of our university. I respectfully acknowledge their ancestors and elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians and their ancestors of the lands and waters across Australia on which our university conducts its business. My name is Tim Fry, I'm the head of the School of Economics, Finance and Marketing. It's an interesting combination. Um, it causes a few headaches sometimes, especially as I was just saying, since our marketing discipline is heavily qualitative in its approach to research. Uh, and, um, and uh, theoretical, that does present some interesting uh, discussions on research topics. Before progressing any further, I'd like to, we'll hear more about our dinner tonight, but I'd like to acknowledge the energy and dynamism and contribution to Australian economics to Marty Dunning, who is Professor of Economics Finance at Tasmania. We'll hear a lot about Marty, but she was one of the early doctors of WEN and got in there and was a mentor and I know that she was sorting this yesterday in the mentoring session. So as I say, we'll hear a little bit more about her tonight. What about the place we're in, RMIT University? It's one of Australia's newer universities. It became a university through Act of Parliament in 1992. Back in 19. 54, it became the first and still the only institution allowed to have the prefix royal for a royal charter, which for the colonials amongst them is still a good thing to have. We like to abbreviate it to RMIT University because we're so young. When we get confused with a bit up the road, we start to alert, and we're actually quite pleased. It means that we may, they may actually think we do the same sort of things. But I thought I'd cast my mind back to the foundation. We're actually an old institution, and we were founded in 1887 through philanthropy, through an initial grant of £5,000, which was more than matched by the Trade Hall Council at the time. So we were founded as a working men's college, working men's college. But our first students arrived in 1888, and, it, and the college offered classes to both men and women. So despite being called a working men's college, we immediately were admitting women. But what sort of things were we teaching? Well, we said it was technical business and arts. So business has been at RMIT for a long time. Our students now, just as then, apply, it's an institution of applied learning, learning and research, which is possibly why our theoreticians feel so lonely at times. We have this long history of applied. But I, I look back and what was the curriculum covering? Well, our students learnt about bookkeeping, shorthand, physics, physiology, photography. Interestingly, we still have degrees in photography. And we have a very big uh, arts, creative arts part. But the thing that struck me, I thought, was the curriculum also covered arithmetic and algebra. And I felt reassured. As an econometrician, we were teaching it back in 1888. <laughs> but if we scroll forward through our history, we've been an institution that is proud to value equity, diversity and equality. And so it was effectively a no-brainer when I was approached by Leonora and the rest of WEN to support this initiative because it sits squarely with our values and our heritage. So rather than take up too much time, the last thing I need to do, and I think you said click on, is acknowledge our sponsors. These events cannot take place without lots of hard work and lots of sponsors. And so 
to the credit of the organising committee, we did actually achieve quite a lot of sponsorship of this organisation. And I don't think they had much trouble getting the sponsorship. They only had to say what it was about and people said, OK, what can we do? But just to acknowledge them, well, obviously, uh, no or organiser like Leonora is going to go past her own head of school. So, yes, uh, we sponsored. Um, but also from RMIT, lots of places we call them research institutes. We call them enabling capability platforms, where we enable the capabilities of the university across the disciplines to come together to work on pro big problems in society. And two of those platforms have supported us, the social change platform and the global business innovation. We have a major sponsor, and we don't mind coming our major sponsor is Monash University. So I'd like to acknowledge the support that they've put in. And in fact, showing the cooperation between universities, the Centre of Policy Studies at Victoria University is also one of our university sponsors. A wide range of government organised or departments have also sponsored us. So the Office for Women and Economic Division within the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Department of Jobs and Small Business, and one which probably was quite easy for you, Leonora, since you used to work there, the Productivity Commission. Finally, uh, we have some community grants from the Victorian Women's Trust and the Ian Potter Foundation and a large partnership with industry through Vic Health, which is underpinning the other keynote speaker. So that's me finished. I hope you enjoy not just the opening address, but also the whole workshop. Um, personal plug, there's a great paper on gender and art prices that my co-authors are presenting later. Um, very different take, but uh, it shows the diversity of issues that economists use their toolkit to come to terms with that relate to gender. So it's a great program, credit to the scientific committee. There hasn't been a glitch, except no one told me the room change, for the organising. I hope you enjoy it. I'm really looking forward to the opening keynote, and I believe Danielle is going to say a little bit about the speaker and introduce it. So thank you. Thank you very much, Tim, and thank you all of you to coming to this um, second Australian Gender Economics Workshop. Um, for those that don't know me, uh, my name's Danielle Wood. Um, I am a program director at the Grattan Institute, a public policy think tank, um, but in my spare time, I'm the chair of the Women in Economics Network. And, um, you know, when I was thinking about this session, I, I thought back to 2016 when we, when we launched the network. So. You know, RMIT may be an old institution, but we are very much a, a new institution. And we'd only been sort of going about six months, and um, Leonora, um, Rebecca, Ashtick, I can't see where you are, but Ashtick, there we go, um, came and said, oh, we, want, we think it's a good idea to hold a gender economics workshop. And I thought, you know, that sounds fantastic and obviously very close to the heart of what we're about, but I thought it seemed, you know, extremely ambitious. And, you know, little did I know that a year and a half later, we held a very first, very successful workshop, and now today, a year later, we're, we're holding an even bigger one. Um, so that's a huge credit to everyone involved. Um, particularly wanted to say thank you to Leonora, who really led the efforts for today's workshop, but to Beck and Ashtick for being involved for a second time, and the whole organising committee that have put in a huge amount of work to make this happen. Um, also like to acknowledge um, the sponsors that Tim mentioned, and particularly the RMIT Global Business Enabling Capability Platform, which is the sponsor of this particular session. Um, so the, the goal of the Women in Economics Network is to promote and support the careers of female economists. And really crucial to that is encouraging women to make more public contributions. So what I really like about the program is I think it gives so much space for our talented female economists to talk about their work and to really have that um, bring fresh perspectives to the policy discussion. Uh, there are, of course, um, a few talented men in there as well. And, and one thing I've always enjoyed about WEN events is most of them are open to men. Um, and we do have men come along. 
but we normally kind of invert the normal gender balance in the profession and it's always really nice to be in the majority for a change. Um, the other thing we've always emphasised um, with the network is that it's about connecting women across the discipline. Um, so it's about women in academia, talking to women in government, talking to women in the private sector. And I think through that kind of cross-collaboration, we end up having you know, much deeper discussions. And you know, I personally feel like it's benefited the way I approach my work, and I hope others have found the same. Um, so I really think this, net, this, this workshop kind of picks up on that spirit, and it's a really great opportunity for all of us to, to sort of mix outside the normal circles. Um, so my job here today is introduce our fantastic speaker, and I, I really can't think of anyone better than Professor Shelley Lumberg to, to kick off proceedings at an event like this. Shelley is a professor of demography and a professor of economics at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Her research has focused on the economics of family behaviour and the determinants of inequality. Her more recent research examines the sources of education inequality and gender gaps. Some recent projects include the effect of child gender on parental behaviour, the location decisions of married couples, the impact of government provided care for the elderly on labour supply of adult children, and the economic and social returns to psychosocial traits. Um, Shelley is also the immediate past chair of the American Committee for the Status of Women in the Economics Profession, uh, which is a bit of a mouthful, but CSWEP for short. Um, Shelley, we have a bit of a, a quirk in Australia if you're sort of trying to put forward um, a, a policy change or a shift in thinking. One way you get a lot of traction is if you can say, look, this is already happening in the United States or the, or the UK or something like that. Um, so I, I sort of felt the, the argument for a Women in Economics Network in Australia was half one where, when I went to the um, Economic Society here and said, the US has been doing this since 1971. <laughs> Um, so you are an old institution, so thank you very much to, to CSWEP for being trailblazers in this, in this space. Um, now Shelley did, unsurprisingly, a fantastic job in her role as chair of CSWEP, and she particularly focused on trying to support the career progression of women in academia. Um, this has culminated in a paper, Women in Economics Stalled Progress, um, that points specifically to some of the barriers impeding women's progress in the discipline. Um, that is the paper that Shelley is going to be presenting today. Um, you know, really looking forward to hearing what she found. Shelley's going to speak for about um, 60 minutes, so I'm just going to ask if we can hold off questions to the end. Um, and Leonora has left plenty of time um, to have a really good discussion about what she's found. Um, so please join me in welcoming Shelley to the stage. Well, thank you, Danielle, for that kind introduction, and uh, many thanks to Leonora and the, the organizers for inviting me to, uh, to this event. I'm really happy to be here. My timer. So make sure I don't spend any longer than uh, <laughs> Australian style. It's <laughs> I don't need, no one needs to talk for more than an hour. Um, I should also say that as the, uh, the CSWEP chair, I've been sort of watching the, uh, the beginning and the progress of the Women in Economics Network here, and I've just been hugely impressed by the energy and the ambition of, uh, of WEN. And so, once again, it's very delightful to be at this event. Um, it was also great to be at the mentoring session yesterday and uh, get to meet a bunch of uh, uh, talented, ambitious young women, and I'm looking forward to uh, looking, watching your research later today. As Danielle mentioned, a lot of this talk is based on my recent paper in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. Um, I want to mention that that was co-authored with Jenna Stearns, a former PhD student of mine who's now an assistant professor at UC Davis and a really fine researcher. And she's so happy to be at Davis because she wants a horse really badly. <laughs> and, and out in Sacramento uh, area, you can potentially have a horse. So looking forward to that next stage in her life. I don't have to tell you this, <coughs> you know this, um, their economics has serious and persistent issues with diversity in the profession, uh, the representation of women and minorities among faculty and graduate students is low, it has always been low, 
And the main thing I want to focus on here is, in the United States at least, and I'm going to focus on the U.S. because I've been immersed in data on uh, the representation of women in the academy in the U.S., there hasn't been any progress lately. Um, so, as it says there, the representation of women among undergraduate majors, graduate students, and junior faculty has been flat or, in some cases, decreasing in the last 15 to 20 years which is kind of an appalling uh, thing to note, I think. The other thing to mention is that um, women have done worse in economics in the last few years than women have done in other STEM fields. And so a lot of the standard you know, excuses being given for why women aren't doing well in uh, academia, well, they have babies, and so they've got all these maternal responsibilities, or women just don't care that much for fields with, uh, with lots of math, do I, I believe so. Oh, you do? do you mind? No, not at all. So how's that? Is that good? Okay. All righty. Um, it's not math and it's not babies, all right? Because women are doing much better. They've been making more progress in engineering, in physics, and in mathematics than they have in economics. There's something particular about economics as a field, and that's part of what I want to, uh, to talk about. The other thing I want to talk about is, in recent years, there's been an increasing body of really rigorous research right, that shows that women do face particular problems in economics. Right? There is increasing evidence that there's actual <laughs> bias in publication, in tenure decisions, and so on. Right? And I, so I think that that can potentially just change the nature of the conversation that we have about diversity and the role of women in economics. The other thing I want to mention is, is I'm going to be focusing on um, women's representation in PhD granting departments in the US. While that's not representative of the workplace of all professional economists, right, it is indicative of the environment within which the next generation of professional economists is being trained. Okay, I'm going to need both hands here. So this is the basic data. So the Committee on the Status of Women in the Economics Profession uh, has an annual survey of 168, i.e. all, of the PhD granting departments in U.S. universities and also a, a sort of comparable sized sample of non-PhD granting departments. This is the results from, uh, since 1993, of women's representation, let me see, as uh, undergraduate majors, um, as incoming PhD students, the, the blue line here is first year PhD students, the red line is new PhDs, uh, this is assistant professors, the orange line is associate professors, so which in most departments have tenure, and the um, green line, which is continuing to chug up very slowly based on the progress that women made decades ago. <coughs> Right, is, is sort of an outlier here. Everything else you can see is, has been totally flat. Right? This comes as a big surprise to I think the vast majority of economists in the US who seem to think that women have in fact been making progress. Um, let me mention also that the CSWEP survey uh, has had a 100% response rate in recent years. Um, CSWEP took the survey back from the AEA in the early 1990s because the AEA was just getting a response rate of about 60%. <clears throat> and what we found is that you can't make arguments about what's happening to women in economics if you have a survey that only gets a 60% response rate because everyone says, oh, it's probably not representative of what's really going on. So we decided all the departments were going to answer this survey, right? And if it takes a phone call from me to the department chair, they're going to turn that survey in. And in the last several years, that's exactly what's happened. <coughs> um, and of course, it's always the same departments that you have to call, right? And I'm talking about you, Stanford, Yale, and Northeastern. It's always the same departments that you have to harass to get these surveys in. It's really pretty annoying. Um, it's even worse if you start looking at the elite departments. Right? And these are the departments, this is the top 20, we also have a, um, uh, a graph of the top 10 departments in the US. And here, the really awful thing that's going on is 
This line here is assistant professors, and what you can see is that that's been falling in the last 10 years. So the fraction of women assistant professors in elite departments is going down. <coughs> and at first we thought, you know, a few years back that might be a blip, but it doesn't appear to be a blip. It seems to be a negative trend. And the outcome there is that there's been no improvement among assistant professors in the 25 years that we've been collecting data with this new survey. Right? And notice that the representation of assistant professor of women among assistant professors in these departments is also below the fraction of women in their PhD programs and among their undergraduates. So we're really concerned about uh, what's going on here. Now, everyone says, well, we thought that women were making progress. And if you go back far enough, <coughs> you can see when the progress took place. So there's one group of departments which we can follow consistently since 1972. 1972 uh, and 73 were when CSWEP did its own first surveys of uh, the representation of women in the academy. And we have, the, the micro data is long lost, but the CSWEP annual report reports separately the results for what, what was known as the chairman's group of 43 economics departments. <coughs> uh, this was also known as the cartel at one point because the chairman of these departments used to meet for breakfast at the um, annual AEA meetings and discuss what salaries they plan to offer to new PhDs. Uh, they don't do that anymore. Um, and so what you can see here is there has, in fact, been a lot of progress in the 1970s and the 1980s. There was a dramatic increase in the um, representation of women in these departments, uh, both among the faculty and in graduate school, and it's been in the last 20 years that it's stalled out. Um, we can also compare our field with other uh, social science and STEM fields. This is the representation of women among assistant professors in roughly top 50 departments in the United States. The top two lines are sociology and psychology. Uh, the middle ones are political science and biology and earth sciences. The black line is economics. And the two other ones down here in the basement with us are math, physics, and computer science is the red line. And the um, uh, yellow line is chemistry and engineering. We sort of lumped a few fields together that had sort of comparable uh, patterns in the representation of women. <coughs> and we have the same departments here showing the representation of women among full professors in these fields. And what you can see is that economics is down in the basement with uh, a selection of other STEM fields, but whereas they've been making progress over the last uh, 20 years or so, economics has stalled out, right? And they've essentially caught up to us. When engineering catches up to you, in the role of women, you know, you know you're in big trouble. And economics is in big trouble in this respect. OK. Um, it's hard to keep track of the time if my, uh, there we go. Um, while Jenna and I were doing this, some people were asking about, uh, hasn't the representation of women across subfields of economics changed over time? Have women sort of branched out from applied micro? <coughs> and so we took a sample of new PhDs in the US uh, and tracked their JEL codes to see whether there had been any, any branching out and to see what fields with a, a sort of a better sample than we usually look at, women were under or overrepresented in. And the answer is pretty much what you'd expect. That, that top line is showing the uh, ratio of the relative ratios of women to men in uh, labor and public. And so as you probably knew, women are sort of somewhat overrepresented in labor and public economics. They are roughly equal to men in most fields, actually. That is, the proportion uh, across fields is about the same. And there's sort of moderate uh, underrepresentation of women in macro finance and in micro theory. All right, but the interesting thing is that no, in fact, it hasn't changed. Uh, it's not just true that women were uh, sort of isolated in, in labor and public in the 1980s and have branched out women's representation across fields has been relatively stable over this time period. Okay, um, so what evidence do we have about the sources 
of this underrepresentation of women. Right. Well, one piece of empirical evidence that um, we've had for quite a long time is that there appears in the U.S. academia to be a leaky pipeline for women at the tenure stage in particular. So quite some time ago, there was a, a paper published by Donna Ginter and Shu Khan, uh, came out in the Journal of Economic Perspectives in 2004, that showed on the basis of a couple of different um, sources of data that 10 years after getting a PhD, female economists were 21 percentage points less likely than men to have a tenured academic uh, appointment and that you could not explain more than a small fraction of it on the basis of publication records or productivity, right? So there's an unexplained disappearance of women at the tenure level, uh, and we don't know why. Uh, since then, Ginter and Kahn have done a bunch of other studies uh, comparing economics uh, to the other social sciences, comparing economics to other STEM fields, and what they have found, in a nutshell, <coughs> is that economics is unique in the extent to which women disappear from academia at the tenure level uh, and in ways that are unexplained by their admittedly somewhat lower publication <coughs> records. And their conclusion here is that, oh, and also that most math intensive fields <coughs> have made demonstrable progress in um, gender equity, both in terms of tenure probabilities and in terms of uh, incomes in the last 20 years, but economics has not. And their conclusion is economics is the one field where gender differences in tenure receipt, and in this study they were looking at the social sciences, seem to remain even after background and productivity controls are factored in. So even for single childless women, right, there is still a gender gap in uh, the probability of getting tenure after an initial academic job. Okay, so um, what, is, uh, what is going on here? Well, I mentioned that there's been a lot of new research. Let me sort of summarize a, a few pieces of that research. First of all, there's a number of recent studies that appear to show actual bias in the assessments of women's scholarship relative to men's. <laughs> Right, and I think most people probably are aware of the interesting paper by Heather Sarsons, who collected data, um, collected the CVs of uh, quite a few cohorts of graduates, uh, I'm sorry, new assistant professors at reasonably high-ranked universities in the United States, and looked at uh, whether they got tenure in their first academic job and had detailed evidence of their publication record. And what she found was that, first of all, women were less likely to have tenure, uh, to receive tenure at their initial appointment, but also she showed that women received less credit in terms of their tenure probability for co-authored research than men did. In fact, women's return to a co-authored paper with a male economist was essentially zero. It had no impact on her probability of receiving tenure. Well, this is a, this is a pretty shocking result. Um, and it suggests very strongly that with co-authored work, women are simply given less credit than their male co-authors. Right? Um, another sort of really depressing paper was done by my student Jenna Stearns, my colleague Kelly Bedard, and Heather Anticole. <coughs> this was recently published in the American Economic Review. And what they looked at was the adoption of gender-neutral tenure clock extension policies among American universities. You know, we, we talked about this yesterday, that the tenure stage at um, sort of highly ranked U.S. universities is a pretty fraught event, right? Almost everyone runs into the problem that their tenure decision comes earlier than they would like, given the publication lags in economics journals. And so everyone is desperately looking for ways to, you know, go on leave, somehow delay your tenure clock. And at some point in the last um, three decades, most universities went from having basically no tenure clock extension policy for new parents um, to 
Some of them adopted ones that were uh, uh, applicable to women only, that only extended the tenure clock of mothers. But the majority of universities have now gone to a gender neutral policy where if you have a, uh, a baby, whether you're a man or a woman, they sort of automatically extend your tenure clock by a year. So they looked at what effect did the adoption of that policy have on the probability that men and women received tenure. So they didn't actually have data on whether you had a kid, they just looked at the, the records for male and female academics. And what they found was shocking. Adopting this policy substantially decreased the probability that women economists receive tenure. And it increased the probability that male economists got tenure. And when they looked at the publication records, they could see what happened. The, um, the adoption of this policy increased the, um, the publication records of men. They, on average, got one more high-profile publication. So you had time, the QJE turned your paper down, now you've got time to send it to the, uh, to the JPE and give it a go. Right? Uh, women's tenure, uh, women's publication records did not change significantly. So clearly what the tenure committee is doing is they are looking at the records of mothers and fathers and cutting them the same amount of slack. Right? Whereas, you know, the, the evidence in the publication records suggests that mothers and fathers were not behaving identically in response to uh, uh, acquiring a child and receiving an extra year on their tenure clock. They have had, the authors of this paper have received so many emails from deans and provosts saying, what, what, what can we do? What can we do about this? This has really shaken up university administrations. And the answer is not clear, I think. It's not at all obvious what you want to do um, with this result. Right? Most universities don't want to uh, punish active participatory fathers, but at the same time, it's going to be important for tenure committees to take this into account. The fact that on average, mothers and fathers do not carry the same amount of, of the load of parenting, and they're going to have to take that into account in making tenure decisions, or they are clearly going to substantially disadvantage women on average. Um, the other uh, mode of depressing papers is a paper by Aaron Hengel, which once again I know a lot of you have, have seen. Um, Aaron has the um, uh, review and editing uh, decisions from Econometrica and looked at both the, the probability of uh, having a paper accepted and what the, um, uh, how long it takes. And what she found was that papers with female authors that eventually get published in Econometrica take six months longer in the review process. Six months is an eternity for an assistant professor uh, facing a competitive um, uh, tenure decision, an eternity. And she also finds that um, she uses a measure of sort of readability that is uh, uh, accepted by linguists as a, a good measure of writing quality uh, and finds that papers by women start out more readable than papers by men and that they rapidly become more readable through the uh, revision, revise and uh, resubmit process, right? And regards that as evidence that papers by women are simply held to a higher standard and sort of the writing quality is, is sort of one potential indicator of uh, the standards to which they're being held. There's a brand new paper by um, Card, De La Vigna, Funk, and Iriberi, just came out in working paper form, that, looks, that extends this by looking at the referee and editorial decisions of four top um, economics journals. And what they find is no evidence that, um, of differential bias by male and female uh, referees, or bias by male versus female editors, but she, they find that all referees and editors appear to hold women to a higher standard. The way they measure that is by looking at the number of citations uh, received by papers published by men and women in the same journal. And women's papers receive more citations, strongly suggesting that the papers 
published by women in these journals are higher quality. Right? So I think we now have really a remarkable amount and a growing quantity of evidence that there is actual bias in this process. There's bias in publication decisions. There's bias in the crucial tenure decisions uh, in American universities and that women are actually at a, a significant disadvantage with respect to their uh, male <coughs> colleagues. Now, I, I think there's lots of other sort of potential mechanisms that we can talk about. Um, women do publish fewer papers uh, and papers at lower ranked journals. Once again, the tenure decisions, there's still a gender gap even after you control for the quantity and quality of publications. But it is undeniably true that on average women publish less. Um, there are a lot of other of possible reasons for those productivity gaps that could be driven by gender also. We tend to not have a lot of economic specific evidence on these mechanisms, although there have been studies for sort of academics or STEM academics in general um, uh, quantifying these, these forces. So women in general are expected to spend more time teaching and mentoring uh, than, uh, than men are, both by their institutions and by their students. Right? So it's possible that those additional responsibilities reduce the amount of time women have to spend on research. Um, there is a, a sort of a prominent uh, lab study, which I should have the citation for here, I'm sorry I don't, finding that women volunteer and are expected to volunteer more than men for low return tasks. Um, there's some evidence that the kind of informal social networks that provide a lot of the mentoring in academia are lacking for women because they are less likely to sort of socialize informally with, uh, with their male uh, colleagues or uh, seniors than women are. And finally, a recent paper looks at collaboration patterns of male and female economists in this case and finds that women's collaboration patterns are ones that are associated with lower productivity. In particular, women have fewer co-authors. They tend to have much stronger clustering with a small number of, of co-authors rather than having more spread out collaboration networks. And they note that those are just sort of characteristics that descriptively are associated with, with shorter publication records. So there are also um, a number of, I think, very important questions that we don't know very much about. And particularly, we don't know much about them in economics. And so we really can't say to what extent do they contribute to women's exit from the, the um, uh, job ladder or to women's lower productivity. And the first one that we have to mention is the aggressive adversarial seminar uh, review, et cetera, process in economics, right? That I don't have to tell anybody about. We all know we're different from all other academics in the extent to which we put each other down, uh, interrupt each other, uh, just generally act in a, in a hostile and uh, an aggressive way. We don't actually know very much. We haven't quantified this very much in economics, but there are studies going on right now. Keep it to yourself. We're supposed to be keeping this quiet, but there's people out there uh, uh, getting data on this, and my expectation is that within the next year, we're going to see a couple of papers on the economic seminar culture. Um, I was at the... Uh, diversity summit that the grad students at Berkeley organized last fall and grad students were being recruited uh, to uh, uh, collect data at seminars at that meeting. And the other issue that I think we, we, we must talk about, though once again we don't have any data on it, is gender harassment. The National Academy of Sciences put out an extensive recent study of gender harassment, and here they mean not just sexual harassment, they mean sort of hostile behavior that makes women feel unwelcome uh, in the field. And what they report is that academia is second only to the military in reported levels of gender and sexual harassment. 
So this is pretty shocking. Uh, it's, you know, the, their interpretation of that is it's a very hierarchical um, uh, job market. Um, it's, uh, junior people are frequently sort of isolated and sort of dependent on, on a small number of senior people for their advancement. And those are just situations that tend to lead to, tend to be fertile ground for gender harassment. And so once again, this is an area where we don't have much quantification of the extent of the problem uh, within economics. Uh, last year, the volume one of CSWEP's uh, uh, newsletter last year had a, uh, a symposium on articles on uh, sexual harassment in economics that included both sort of some personal stories and also some uh, opinions by experts of, of what can be done about it. So I, I urge you to have a look at it if you're, if you're interested. In general, you should be on the mailing list for CSWEP's newsletter. This wasn't on my talk, but you really should be. Just send an email to CSWEP and get on the, the mailing list and we will uh, email you a newsletter three times a year. It's full of lots of professional development advice um, that almost any economist would find useful, I think. So, um, where does that leave us? So, so do male economists know about this stuff? No, they don't know about this stuff. Um, so there was a 2008, this is a little old, but a 2008 survey of American Economic Association members found that women know about it. So 76% of women, uh, and this is before all the, the recent spurt of uh, empirical evidence came out, believe that opportunities for economics faculty in the U.S. favor men. Fewer than 20% of the male AEA members uh, shared that view. And in fact, one third of male economists felt that opportunities in economics favor women. Uh, and, and if you ever look at uh, economics job market rumors, that famous site, uh, cesspool of misogyny as one prominent uh, economist called it, you know that a lot of those guys are positive that they missed out on a job because some women got it, woman got it instead. So as of 2008, right, the, the awareness is, is pretty low. It's not where we would like it to be. And one thing that I'm interested in seeing over the next couple of years is whether all this published, rigorous, empirical evidence actually gets through, right? And I just don't know what the answer to that is going to be yet. I think that remains to be seen. So, well, this is really a downer. I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, in response to this paper of Jenna's and mine being such a downer is I thought that I would um, steal some material from the other two papers in this uh, Journal of Economic Perspectives Symposium on Women in Economics, which are much more positive and, um, and actually provide us with some, some ideas about productive actions that individual faculty members can take, uh, that uh, supervisors and department chairs can make uh, and that university and agency administrations can, uh, can pursue. So let me re rely on um, Casey Buckles, who looked at uh, strategies for making economics work for women at every stage, and Leah Bastan and her student Andrew Langen, who looked at the sources of variation in women's success in PhD programs. So let me sort of review a little bit what they, uh, what they found. So Casey um, reviews a whole variety of interventions and strategies. Most of them, she focuses on ones that have actually been rigorously evaluated to see if they're effective or not. Um, and, you know, she starts out at some point looking at, at K-12, right, uh, uh, grade school education and makes some suggestions for changes in the economics curriculum. They didn't offer economics courses when I was in grade school, but, but my understanding is in the U.S. there's some advanced placement courses, and I believe some Australian schools offer economics at that level uh, as well. And the particular suggestion is that um, economics at that level should give a much broader uh, picture of what economists do than the current curriculum does. 
right? The current curriculum is sort of focused on macro and finance and banking and, and uh, you know, corporate profits and stuff like that, uh, whereas uh, a curriculum that's introducing to, um, uh, kids to economics should include work in health and education and, uh, and family and environmental economics and so on, just give a much broader view of what economics can be uh, applied to and what economists can do. Um, the other thing I'm going to sort of just pass over quickly is she talks about some mid-career programs. And I should say that, that one of the um, biggest demands that CSWEP has been hearing in recent years is a call or a demand for more mid-career mentoring. That we're finding that a lot of women, both in academia and in government agencies and in the private sector, reach a point where they just feel bogged down in their career. Right, with family responsibilities, um, you know, professional service and administrative demands, um, and with low visibility because they're not being invited as much to, to seminars and, and uh, uh, speaking engagements and so on. And so CSWEP is currently trying to develop additional programs that are aimed not just at junior economists but also at, uh, at mid-career people. So that's something that's we're, we're clearly seeing a, uh, a request for that. But what I want to focus on here are, um, is Casey's discussion of uh, uh, interventions at two levels. One is undergraduates, right, because clearly we have a pipeline problem. So um, undergraduate majors are only about 30% female. Right? And so we're not going to, we're not going to get to 50-50 at the, the faculty and professional economist level right, without boosting uh, that end of the pipeline. Um, and this is something that's been, uh, has received a lot of attention recently. Claudia Golden and Tatiana Avalova uh, started a program that they called the Undergraduate Women in Economics Challenge. And uh, with a grant from the Sloan Foundation, they recruited several dozen economics departments who were willing to be randomized into treatment and control departments, where the treatment departments would be given a smallish budget to develop um, some strategies or programs to increase the representation of women in their undergraduate majors. And it was up to them how to do it. The, the suggested mechanisms were changing the curriculum of undergraduate courses, once again, to sort of more uh, broaden out the um, picture that it gives of what economists do, improve information about what economists do and how to succeed as an economics major, right? And um, what some programs did is, is they tried to provide more female role models in, in various ways. And papers are starting to come out because some of the uh, individual departments actually randomized their treatment, um, and some of the findings are that uh, this paper by Porter and Sarah uh, had a, an undergraduate committee who chose um, alumni of the program, female alumni, who were considered to be sort of charismatic, right? So they actually sort of interviewed potential speakers, and when they found somebody who was a compelling speaker who really told a good story, they would have them come into an undergraduate class, an introductory class, and give a talk about, about what they do. And they found that, that the appearance of that role model substantially increased the probability that women in that introductory class would take a follow-up courses in economics. It actually seemed to have a substantial impact on the undergraduate's curriculum decisions. Um, some of the other programs um, just tried to give uh, uh, more information about the fact that you got a B-plus in your introductory course does not, in fact, mean that you're not cut out to be an econ major. And so in many programs, uh, they discovered that women would only tend to persist as econ majors if they got A's in their introductory courses. Men, however, would persist right down to a C-plus, right? And, you know, C-plus, hey, not bad. Let me, you know, <coughs> I'm, I'm good at this. <coughs> Whereas the women would say oh, my heavens, I got an A minus, I better switch to communications. Uh, and this actually seems to be a real phenomenon. So providing information, what does a grade distribution look like? You know, in most American universities, 
you know, economics and chemistry are renowned for having lower grade distributions than any other field. And this in itself appears to be harming our um, uh, gender equity among our undergraduates. Okay, so this, this whole program has, has uncovered a bunch of potential mechanisms whereby economics departments can increase the attractiveness of their major to, uh, to female undergraduates and, and sort of get, give us a start on trying to get more women into graduate school and ultimately into professional um, economics. Uh, UCSB, because we're broke, uh, even though we're a treatment department, have tried a real low-cost intervention, uh, which we randomized, but we don't have the, uh, the results yet. Uh, we decided to uh, send a letter to all students who got a B plus or more in introductory economics in our massive introductory economics classes. We teach them to 600, 800 people at a time. Um, and the randomization was, in, in one case, we just said, we're going to have some uh, information sessions about becoming uh, a major, an economics major. And in the other ones, we said, you did really great in your introductory class. You were obviously meant to be an econ major. By the way, we're having an informational uh, meeting. And one thing we do know is that that enthusiastic personal letter did increase attendance at the information sessions. What we haven't seen yet, because we're just still accumulating a large enough sample size, is whether it actually increases majors and whether it has a differential effect on men and women. So that still remains to be seen. The other thing that, that Casey talks about is, in this paper, is in general programs for junior faculty, right? To try to increase uh, women's uh, research productivity, their effectiveness as, uh, as junior faculty members, and their probability of tenure. And this is something that CSWEP has a lot of experience in uh, since the, uh, uh, for the last 15 years or so, we've had an annual, not, no, sorry, it just became annual, it used to be biannual, intensive mentoring program for junior faculty at the ASSA meetings every year. And uh, what we can do with this is, is it's a two-day meeting. Um, there's two separate ones, one for uh, faculty in doctoral programs or uh, economists in uh, non-academia who have similar research expectations. So basically an intense research. And there's another one for faculty in non-doctoral programs where the teaching requirements and the teaching expectations are much more substantial. So they have a somewhat different focus. In each um, annual program, we have 40 participants and 16 senior mentors, right? And women are divided up into small groups based on their, their research field. <clears throat> uh, and the meetings consist of some large group panels where the, the senior mentors will discuss sort of themes, how to get your research published, how to get uh, grants funded, uh, sort of work-life balance issues, and so on. But then the meat of the mentoring program is intensive discussions within each of the groups where they discuss a working paper uh, for each of the, the mentees that's been uh, distributed in advance, right? So there's a lot of hands-on um, advice both among the, the peers and between the senior mentors and the, the junior mentees. Uh, and in the early years when this was offered every other year, there was always, it was hugely oversubscribed. And so there was room for only about half of the women who applied to it. And so you can do an RCT uh, because the majority of women who got randomized out Two years later, they weren't really, they were far enough along in their career that they weren't interested in, in taking the program. So we've got some treated and some controls and a paper by Janet Curry, Fran Blau, a bunch of other, Donna Ginter, a bunch of other people compared the early career success of the cement mentees and, uh, and the controls and found that the program did appear to increase your publication record and to increase the number of grants you had funded. And there's an ongoing evaluation of longer-term uh, career progression going on now that's going to look at tenure rates and so on. All right. So it's an effective program. And the, the difficulty is that um, it's, it takes up two days of the time 
of 16 productive uh, uh, senior women. And so it's always hard to uh, recruit mentors for it. Uh, you know, lots of people would like us to expand it, but it just doesn't seem to be feasible. Nonetheless, it's an easy kind of program for other agencies to put on. And if anyone is associated with an agency who would be interested, right, all of the professional development materials are available online. And the people who run it, including Martha Bailey, the current director, are really interested in sort of explaining how it works to, to try to propagate this sort of thing. Um, and, oh, in this, I, I also wanted to mention that, that um, Wynn is also involved in these kinds of activities also, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about how, how that's been going as well. Okay, just switching to the other um, JEP paper, and then I'm going to be then I'm going to be done. Is Leah Bastan and Andrew Langen uh, used uh, used CSWEPS data on uh, job placements by new PhDs, and they also collected their own data on uh, early career success for new PhDs, and they combined them in this study. How does the uh, share of women vary across PhD programs? And the answer is enormously. Uh, so they just, this is just from the CSWEP data, the share of women, uh, it's gone up from 1994 to 2005 to 2006, uh, 2017, right? But the share of women varies from 20% to 80%, depending on the program. And they also found that the variation is persistent. So some programs, uh, consistently uh, admit more women uh, than others do. Um, so it's persistent over time. It tends to be correlated, they ran a regression, it's correlated with the female share of faculty, so departments with more women faculty tend to admit more uh, female students. Uh, it's related to the, to the metro size of the campus. Um, and it tends to be characteristic of somewhat lower ranked departments within this sort of fairly uh, a highly ranked field. It's not strangely correlated with faculty fields. So the immediate thing that people thought is departments with lots of women have lots of applied micro and that's why they have more female students. That's, that's actually not true. Just correlated with uh, faculty gender and not faculty uh, field mix. So then they collected the, or I guess Andrew collected the early career outcomes by gender for 22 department graduates. And what they found was that in the US, and the question is whether this is true in Australia or not, people have suggested maybe not, from the same department are equally likely to place in a US uh, doctoral department. Um, however, conditional on being placed in the academy, uh, women tended to be placed in lower ranked departments and they published less than the male graduates of the same program in their first seven years uh, post PhD. And here's just sort of the graph of, uh, they're showing um, uh, men on the horizontal axis, women on the vertical axis, uh, uh, average rank of the first placement right, tends to be uh, veered towards men, <coughs> doing better. Uh, top five publications, right, men have uh, significantly more publications in top five department, top five journals, and uh, expanding that out to <coughs> the top 55 journals. You know, it's time for me to drink some of this water. Sorry, excuse me. Men do somewhat better. Uh, the difference in being of being ever promoted is actually not significant. It looks like it favors men, but the difference isn't significant. Okay, let me bring that back. So they wanted to know why, <laughs> but this was too hard to actually um, collect quantitative data on, so they decided to sort of take a, a major methodological leap and they decided to collect some ethnographic uh, information to try to figure out why the success rates of um, 
uh, women relative to men, their publications and their placement, seem to vary across departments. And so they did a series of um, uh, structured interviews. In fact, I think they had a qualitative researcher do it for them. They started out with department chairs, and through the department chairs, they acquired information about some recent graduates from the program and some faculty members who were involved with graduate students uh, to a significant extent. And they ranked the departments on a number of characteristics. They conducted these interviews with five departments, two of which did particularly well in terms of the placement and productivity of their female relative to their male graduates. Two departments that were bad uh, and one in the middle. And here's what they found. Departments that did well in placing and promoting the publication of their female graduates expressed a strong commitment to hiring women on the faculty. Right, and this consists of not just having a, a high fraction of female faculty, but also the expression of some institutional commitment. And so what some people said was, you know, um, the dean is very supportive of us uh, making progress on the diversity frontier. In fact, we know that if we have a really attractive female candidate, it could even bring us an extra position, right? And so those kinds of remarks were strongly correlated with departments that actually performed well by their female graduates. Um, a lot of former uh, students reported that that had a very strong sort of role model and demonstration effect. Uh, the students, the female students said, you know, I can see the female faculty, I know they can do it, and that means I can do it too, and be a woman. Uh, worst departments, if you talk to both their previous graduates and their current faculty, either have only come up recently with a focus on hiring women, or else they report that they, they face no in particular institutional prefer, uh, pressure, and they don't have any strong focus in their hiring on increasing diversity. So they actually found a bunch of people who were willing to actually say that. Um, and so one of the sort of senior faculty at one of these departments uh, sort of said explicitly, well, we try to pay attention when we're uh, uh, interviewing people at the meetings or when we're doing flyouts to kind of get a general impression when we're, whether we're being gender neutral. So we try to do that at least on our junior hiring. And that was about as, that was as strong a statement as they could come up uh, with. The other characteristic of departments that do well, and once again, this isn't quantitative information, this is just the suggestions that they're getting from people that they're talking to, um, is there's regular and transparent processes for student advisor <coughs> contact. And so everybody knows that compared to most other disciplines, finding an advisor as a graduate student in economics is a very decentralized and informal process. Right? In a lot of, in science, in most of the sciences, in most other social sciences, when you apply for a PhD program, you already know who you want to study with. You make it clear in your application, I want to join the lab of X, or I want to study Y with professors A and B. In economics, you just come in blind, and you sort out over time sort of what your fields are going to be and who you're going to be working with, and we know that lots of graduate students end up falling through the cracks and even disappearing for a while. Some of the options by departments that tended to do well, particularly well by their female PhD students, they either had mandatory and regular student works in progress seminars where all students were required to present on an annual or even a by seminar basis, get comments from a group of committed faculty in the field who tended to show up to that graduate student seminar. Um, some of these programs had third year research advisory groups that once again, everyone was required to go to. Right? And so the presence of these kind of mechanisms, mandatory, regular, uh, and so on, was associated with departments that did better by their female students, and they speculate that this might be more important for women because they lack these other sort of informal social mechanisms for acquiring mentoring. Um, the worst departments, the student presentation seminars, even if they're available, aren't actually required. 
and the faculty report that, yeah, some students just get lost between their, their third and fourth years in particular. Uh, number three, uh, the people associated with the departments who do better report that they have a more collegial seminar culture. Right? What they report is that the research seminars tend to be less combative, less aggressive, uh, much more constructive than the departments that tended to be bad performers. And this is particularly true. Uh, they report having social norms that particularly prohibit or discourage aggressive behavior towards graduate students who are presenting. Right, and here's something, I mean, this is something, as the authors note, that individual faculty can take action on this one. All right, so we're, we're responsible as individuals for the atmosphere in our seminars. And they suggest also that if you find yourself in a, an aggressive seminar culture, you have the option of meeting with the, with the student presenter later and giving them one-to-one -one feedback, right, and providing a much less uh, sort of public and um, uh, off-putting way of providing feedback. And once again, they speculate, but we don't actually have any strong evidence of that at this point, that women may be more affected by this aggressive seminar culture just because of the way we're socialized. Finally, um, departments that do well by their female students uh, report that there's a stronger kind of general awareness of gender issues among the senior faculty. And I, I recommend that you, you go and have a look at the Bustan and Langham paper and look at the quotes from senior faculty about this because you, they're so familiar. You will just you'll say, I know that guy. You know, I know that guy. So in, in general, the senior faculty in these departments that do well are actually aware that there are subtle uh, sources and implicit sources of gender bias, right? They volunteer the information that they understand that that's going on in the profession. And what, they, what the authors observe is that just the senior faculty in these departments respond to questions about the treatment of women in more observant and thoughtful ways, which I thought was an interesting way to put it. And the faculty in the worst departments say things like, well, we don't discriminate against women students, or I'm pretty sure there's not, I'm pretty sure there's not any bias against women. And, um, and they just are general, they're unaware, or they actively express disbelief in the notion that women are at any kind of a disadvantage in their program. They say, nah, we don't, we don't do that. Um, they also note that almost all departments have face cases of harassment at some point, usually grad student on grad student, but not always. And what they report here is that there are distinct differences in how departments face this. Some departments simply put a stop to it, maybe punish the, um, uh, the perpetrators of it. Other departments say, can we figure out what led to this event? Can we figure out what sort of institutional structure in our department led this to happen or allowed this to happen? And can we make sort of broader ranging changes that will make this kind of behavior less likely in the future, right? And they noted a, a clear distinction in sort of the attitude towards facing um, gender-related issues of that sort. That the departments that observably seem to do well in placing their female students and in having students that tend to, female students that tend to be more successful are also concerned with the, the culture in their departments, right, explicitly. Okay, so let me, let me wrap up. I hope that's a little bit more hopeful than my own uh, paper uh, led you to believe. Um, but, so basically my, my bottom line is, we have not seen a whole lot of progress in recent years in the representation of women in economics in the United States. And I haven't seen any data that suggests that this picture is dramatically different in other countries as well. The other point I want to make is there's an increasing body of really rigorous, believable evidence showing that women actually do face bias in economics 
either in the assessment of their research, in tenure decisions, in the publication decisions, or via the kind of institutional arrangements, such as this gender neutral uh, tenure clock extension policy that significantly disadvantage women. Right? And my hope is that this research and the other research that's being conducted as we speak is going to help bring awareness to, of this gender bias to the economics profession overall, more broadly. And finally, I hope I've demonstrated through the work of Casey Buckles, Leah Bustan, and Andrew Langan, that there's a lot that we can do. You know, I've seen that in the last three years as chair of CSWEP. Um, CSWEP attempts to provide information, to provide mentoring, to provide sort of professional advice uh, to all junior economists, right? And we feel that there's, that we have helped, that we've done something. Um, but I think there's a lot more that we can do just as mentors to our graduate students, um, as colleagues to other economists, or as leaders, either in <laughs> academic departments or in um, agencies where professional economists work, there's a lot we can do to advance the status of women um, in our field. So I encourage you, you know, as, as you progress in your careers, to try to pay it back and, and focus in the future on the uh, junior economists coming after you uh, and try to put some of these suggestions into, uh, into action. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Shelley, for that started somewhat depressing but ended on a hopeful note um, opening to the conference. Um, for those of you that haven't seen the Australian data around this, um, unfortunately we don't have that nice time series to see what's been happening over time, but in terms of kind of the snapshot undergraduate economics degrees, 30 to 35 percent women. Yeah. Um, we don't have numbers for PhD programs, but we know that a lot of people working in academia in Australia actually did their PhDs elsewhere. Um, about 25 percent women at the sort of lecturer, senior lecturer level, and that falls away to about 10 to 15 percent once you get to the associate professor, professor level, and lower again at, at GO8 universities, so um, the, the leaky pipeline That's is very much That's here beautiful. as well. It's That's almost, insane. yeah, the numbers are almost <laughs> bang on. Yep. Um, so clearly, um, you know, probably not unreasonable to suggest that, that many of the same issues that you've seen in the US probably um, do exist here. Um, so I now want to give the chance to, um, for people to ask questions of, of Shelley. Um, I don't know if anyone saw that great paper that came out a couple of years ago that said um, in seminars, if the first question asked is to a woman, um, you actually get a much higher share of women asking questions for the rest of the seminar. Um, so that's always my policy when I moderate. Um, it's, I think it's going to be much easier today than um, <laughs> at, at any other seminar. But please, you know, do um, take this opportunity to, to, to ask Shelley some questions. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Helen Hodgson from Curtin University, and thank you very much for that, Shelley. That was really enlightening. I suppose what I want to comment on is from an Australian perspective, and this is not just the economics discipline, but more like the university hierarchy. Everybody working in economics needs to be on top of what the Athena Swan Program is doing at their own university. Now, the Athena Swan Program is accrediting universities in terms of their gender equity programs across the whole of the so it started in sciences, but most universities who signed on to it are expanding across the whole university. So I've just seen the Athena Swan plan that's been put out for Curtin University, and there are issues in there that I think that everybody who's um, working in an economics faculty should grab onto and have a look and see how can we actually get this implemented, not just, not just a paper document and a plan, but what can we do to actually progress this plan? For example, one of the things in the current plan, for those of you who couldn't have seen it yet, focuses on um, interdisciplinary um, networks, gender networks across the whole university. And that's the sort of thing that we should be getting involved in and promoting and making sure that our faculties, our schools um, are aware of and our faculties to get on with that. So thank you. I think the situation in Australia is similar in a lot of ways to the US, but I think that this is an external that we can 
Is Athena swan a person? That's what I figured. Is Athena swan a person? Uh, Athena swan, it comes from the UK. It's on a lot of UK programs. And it's um, I can't remember what the acronym stands for. Oh, okay. It's, it's an acronym. Okay. And, uh, gender throughout, okay. Uh, throughout the students. Okay. So thanks. I'll look into that. We have other questions. About the seminar culture in the last 22 years since I've been an academic post that's that something drive change or anything part of it. You know, recently I've been talking about this work that's going on. Recently the work goes on the world and talk about post in development. So he did exactly this, kind of tabulating how many questions were asked by men and women. So the best. Oh, this World Bank blog? Is that what you said? Yes. Yeah, I saw that. Yes. My Once daughter sent that to me. The best case scenario of questions by uh, females to men. Yeah. Uh, the first question was always by men. There was no follow up question by females. And again, the ratios, the attendees were 1 to 2 on oh. average. Uh, so it's a question of the seminar culture I feel it is that Monash what you've done is you try to have a moratorium of questions the last 15 minutes of talk. Uh, saying that we'd like to see people finishing the talk. You know, we'd like to know the results. But there's not a problem on that. And so most of the people start with women unfortunately. Uh, and similarly with respect to seminar time, uh, I've been, you know, I've had to follow this one with our kids at 4 30. Or is it to these seminars and seminars are before? And we change the group then. But then there's been a lot of animosity against changing the seminar and group, you know, earlier in the day. Uh, oh, we want to finish the whole year. Then go to the seminar and go for drinks. That's the major attitude. It's not only from men. Yeah, so it puts, puts parents of young children at a substantial disadvantage, yeah. So I know, I, I, have, I have heard reports from several departments in the U.S where the seminar times have been changed in the last couple of years because the, the young parent, the young committed parent crowd has become much more diverse. And so there are now a lot more men saying, I need to get out of here by, by five o'clock. You know, I can't hang around for another couple of hours because there were departments that had seminars from, from 4.30 to 6.30, you know, which if you've got a kid in daycare is really... Yeah, oh, okay. And the other thing relevant to your earlier point is, is there are some institutional uh, uh, attempts going on to try to combat the seminar culture issue. So I know that um, the NBER development group right now has a first 15 minutes, no questions kind of thing. I think Duncan Thomas put that in when, when he was heading up that group. <coughs> so that kind of initiative has become much more common. Um, but I think, once again, we're going to need to see the data First, okay, so w when this when this next raft of studies comes out, um, actually quantifying whether f and here's the thing: it's not the question that remains open is not just whether we have an aggressive seminar culture because we do. That's clear. One of the the, the remaining questions is: Do women speakers get treated differently from male speakers? Are they more likely to be interrupted? Um, and and what, as you say, like the World Bank blog, uh, small data collection. Um, how disproportionate are the questions from male audience members versus female audience members? So that we're going to find out uh, in the in the near future, and it'll be interesting to see. Thank you so much for that um, Hi, Mary. talk. I, I have, any, uh, I guess, a question. If you have any insights of what to do with what I call um, the little trumps when you say you know disbelief, fake news. Nothing is going on. All those um, departments where I have, um, you know, people who just say, you know, we don't discriminate. There is nothing going on. What would, you, what would be your suggestion in terms of? Uh, expand on that just slightly, Mary. I'm what, what, saying that who, um, not believing what? Not believe that there is anything going on in terms of bias. Or we don't discriminate. So you were saying that there were certain in in, in places where women tend to be more stagnant. They tend to be associated with what I call, you know, Trump or fake news 
um, believe that there's nothing going on. Yeah. Um, what do you do? You have any, you know, insights? Well, well, one thing that, that's that's under construction. I, be, I believe this is true. This was true when I when I stopped being chair of CSWEP. Is at some point we're going to have a page on the CSWEP website that has links to all the relevant research. So I think just so you can just point, give, send somebody a URL and say, read some studies, right? I think that the body of research is now so substantial and it's growing all the time. It's clear there's something going on. So for me, the shocking point is that we're researchers. They are researchers themselves, some of them. But then you disbelieve, you dismiss that sort of research. You, you, you see, like it's like a really, like, Yes, well, that, that's true. I mean, the, I've seen that the critics of the Sarsons and, and Hengel papers have, you know, it's amazing how creative people can be on the weird ways you could have got that result that doesn't actually mean that it's gender related. <coughs> right, okay. So uh, here's a story I told yesterday. Uh, so I was at um, a, a meeting, a lunch meeting of the AEA leadership with my successor as head of CSWEP, Judy Chevalier. And one very prominent guy in the AEA said, wow, this is really interesting, all this evidence coming out about bias and economics, but I've got to say, it doesn't happen in any department I've ever been at. <laughs> so, and she looked at him and she said, I'm going to tell you about a couple of tenure cases. Let's go off in the corner and I'm going to tell you about a couple of tenure cases where it's pretty clear there was gender bias and it was in your department. Um, and, and so I think that and so the, the story here, when it comes to tenure decisions, and, and this is what I, I talked to the, the junior people about yesterday, is you've got some people where your assessment of their research program could go either way, maybe yes, maybe no. But when it's him, you say, yeah, but you know, that stuff he did with his advisor, his, uh, his supervisor early in his career, really he was responsible for a lot of the creative thought and, and interesting methodological work on those papers. And he's such a great colleague, and you know, he's got great comments for people at seminars, and you know, you know, potentially I could see a research collaboration down the road, so let's give him tenure anyway. But her, with an identical research career, you know, all that work was done with her research advisor, you know? And, and so, you know, he's, you know, probably, you know, so-and-so, her advisor was responsible for most of the interesting ideas there. And, you know, she's a bit abrasive. And, right, and these are how tenure decisions get made, I think. And, 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 and yeah, I've heard people talk just the same way you do. Like, all these decisions were fair and unbiased. But we can't make fair and unbiased decisions like that. We're incapable of it. You know, the only solution here is a real sharp awareness of the, the gender dimension of those kinds of subjective decisions and some clear rules about how those decisions get made. And I think at the moment, you know, most uh, American academics can come up with all kinds of inconsistent tenure decisions that were made at top departments where you could really argue that there was a strong gender bias involved. If I may just follow up on Marion's question and this topic. So the heart of the question is what do we do with these deniers, these resistors? Yeah. And it's not unique just to gender inequality and economics. You think about gender inequality in society. Yeah. We're facing these deniers and, and resistors. And um, there's no denying this wealth of evidence that these biases and that discrimination exist. And what's happened in society in general is that we're, we're looking for evidence of how um, we pay a price, not just as an individual, but as a society for, for all this lack of gender representation. So perhaps is there a way that we need to move forward within the economic profession to not just point out where these biases exist, but also to point out where the output and the performance and the productivity of the economics profession is falling short. And Shelley, you made a point yesterday in the major session. You reminded us, you said, economics is going to be better with you in it, talking to young females. How do we convince the resistors, the deniers, that economics is going to be better with more women in it? That is such a hard question. <laughs> That is such a hard question, and I don't, think, I don't think I have a glib answer for that one. I really don't. And I, I think that, you know, once again, as I said yesterday, I think that that is where economics stands apart from STEM fields, right, in this disbelief 
that diversity per se has any value for a research uh, enterprise. Um, and, and I think that, you know, it would be easy for me to say, you know, a lot of the research that I'm well known for, no guy would have done it. <laughs> but, but that's, you know, because I work in family and gender areas. However, you have to be able to make the point much more broadly than research um, fields where you're dealing with gender or, or where you're dealing with the, the different experiences of men and women more directly. Um, because I think that, that the value of diversity is much broader than that, and it applies all over economics, macro, finance, environment, and so on. Um, and I don't know how you, how you make that point. Um, you know, many people have, have pointed to sort of only tangentially related evidence that, you know, corporations now seem to feel that there's a value to having diverse management, and they go out of their way, right? If, profit-seeking enterprises think diversity is valuable, then perhaps it will be within economics as well. Um, to studies that have found that um, um, committees and uh, research groups that are diverse have better outcomes. So I think that, that one can point to, to that kind of evidence. But my experience is that that just goes whoosh. You know, well, economics is different, right? That, you know, Diversity doesn't have any value in economics. Uh, I think that's. A, I think you have you have zeroed in on a genuinely difficult issue. Question is related to In most universities, when you are promoted to associate or professor level, the promotion committees, uh, you know, university level, and. People at the NUS committee put in all the problems we face in economics. They will be aware of some problems, but not us. I think part of the problem is economics is not visible, like our problems often not visible in the society, so we don't get support from the society that stands yes. in terms of uh, promoting diversity. Do you think uh, the economic association in America and Australia could have a role to, not, you know, to inform universities about these discriminations we face, because as individuals we have a limited um, power to do that, but associations might have. Yeah, what I'm wondering is what, what the mechanism for that might be. I, I think that's a very good point. Um, I, I think what I've found is that the university committees that play a role in, in promotion decisions, which, and, and the, the power of those committees compared to the department, varies enormously across institutions. <clears throat> but in some institutions, they're relatively powerful. They tend to be very sensitive to gender diversity more broadly. And so they, you know, if they've got a, a promotion decision, they are looking at that department. And one thing they are always paying attention to is, is what is the, uh, the gender composition of that department. And so I think, in fact, those kinds of committees outside economics perform much better in terms of recognizing that, that women face some disadvantages. And they all know about economics. I, I, I think they all know about economics. I mean, these committees have people in the humanities, the social sciences, the hard sciences. Economics has a reputation. And I think that reputation is reflected in the kinds of decisions those committees make. And it's possible that, that there are some situations where they are clueless, but I would... Um, Maybe, and so I'd be, I'd, 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 tell me more about that later. I'd be interested in hearing about that. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, my question is, uh, are gender wage gaps, within, are they a part of this uh, gender bias uh, in the uh, US, in the academia? Are you aware of any studies on uh, gender wage gaps in, in economics? Uh, I'm asking because I know that money is important, uh, just for a positive picture of uh, uh, of the gender gap in academia in Europe, uh, in several Eastern European countries, uh, women are much more represented among professors and associate professors than in Western European countries. But this comes mostly from the underfinancing of, uh, of uh, science and of uh, economics. And as uh, the money keeps flowing in, uh, the uh, relative advantage, advantage of female professors, I think, are like 25% of females are professors. Uh, that is the declining, just because men are becoming more poor, like you say, in academia. Yeah. Uh, can you share some thoughts on that? Um, 
So I know a little bit about that. So there, there ha so some of the studies by Gintercon and, and others, in particular the one that they had a collaboration with a couple of psychologists and they looked broadly across STEM fields, uh, using the National Science Foundation doctoral data, and they do find a significant gender wage gap among um, economists, economics acad academics. Um, they, they find a, a gender wage gap in, in STEM fields more broadly, but they find that it's been shrinking in the last 20 years, and the economics gap has not been shrinking, apparently. I've been involved in a couple of um, uh, faculty equity studies, both at the University of Washington and UCSB, where we look explicitly at are there uh, gender and ethnicity gaps, and, and we have never found a significant gap. Uh, between men and women in either one of those, w once you control for field, obviously. And there's too small a sample to look explicitly at economics. It's, uh, it's too far. So the, the, the evidence is a little bit mixed with a, a lean towards, yeah, there appears to be a, an actual income gap as well. Hi, thank you for the very insightful talk. So um, I think... Um, this conversation around tenureship sort of took a leap with um, the Nobel laureate Donna uh, Strickland's um, comment when she said, you know, I never got about to, I was told to uh, apply for tenureship, I never got about to doing it for some reason. So I was just wondering whether you've got, come across any evidence that suggests that men and women sort of um, uh, way um, tenorship in a different way uh, or, or the timing that they give um, when it comes to applications is somewhat different in their perception of how they value tenorship um, uh, whether there is a gender differential there? That, that's an interesting question. So, so once again, most of my experience is within the U.S. so the, the experience is going to be different outside. The, the timing of the, the tenure and promotion to associate decision is, is fixed by the American Association of University Professor Rules that says seven years up or out. And so that is roughly fixed. Where, where there's a suspicion that women are doing badly is on the promotion from associate professor to full professor, where there's just a huge amount of flexibility. And departments make that decision at, at very different times and on no fixed schedule. Once again, the, the two salary equity studies that I've been involved with have looked at, uh, at your um, uh, rank after following, uh, compared to how many years it's been since your PhD, and have not found um, evidence of a gender uh, delay in promotion to full. But anecdotal information at other, uh, and, and that's overall disciplines, but anecdotal information from economics in particular suggests that Lots of women get stuck at associate, and there's sort of a lack, I think, of good empirical evidence uh, to, to show whether, in fact, that's a widespread phenomenon or not. Uh, with, with the notion being that, well, I, uh, sort of when I got promoted to full, it was pretty late, and at some point, my department chair, who really didn't like me very much and, and was not exactly a mentor, came into my office, which is the first time he'd ever come to my office. I was so astonished to see him there. And he said, you know, so-and-so just asked if we would uh, put them up for promotion to full this year. And I kind of looked around, and it would be ridiculous to put him up for full without putting you up for full at the same time. So should we do that? And, and I had, and the senior people in the department at the time included my longtime collaborator, Bob Pollack, my husband, and other people who might have said to me, you know, aren't you ready to be promoted to full? And no one ever did. And so, and I think that happens a lot, is just, it, once again, lack of empirical support for that proposition. But I would be surprised if women were just, weren't just less aggressive in sort of lobbying their department chair and their senior colleagues and saying, you know, it's time to put me up for promotion. But I can't, I can't support that with data. Um, I'd like to go back to the comments about diversity and people being sold on the value of diversity. But I also accept that it's a hard sell. But the, you know, the evidence you've shown us makes it clear that the best people are not being chosen for tenure. And so it's, it's not just about diversity. The, the 
the profession will be weaker if we do not choose the best people. And, uh, you know, and perhaps that's the line to take with our maybe not so warm and heavily colleagues. Yes, I think that's an excellent point. And I think, yes, we now do have lots of evidence that the best people are not being chosen, that there's some bias in that. And so beyond the, 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 the fact of bias itself means that we're not in an optimal situation. We're not being efficient in, in the decisions. We are not optimizing. We are not on the frontier. We're not on the research frontier. Actually, you know another thing that's kind of worrying me is the joint career thing. And so lots of academics are paired up with academics, including lots of economists are paired up with economists. And this has now become a situation where it's not always the department wants to hire him and we got to figure out something to do with her. A lot of the time it's we want to hire her and we got to figure out something to do with him. And what I've been observing is there's a certain asymmetry in how that gets treated, even by the couple themselves. And so, I mean, I'm from a generation where lots of women in my cohort ended up in a dead-end lectureship position, never, you know, either left the tenure track <coughs> or didn't get on the tenure track because they were optimizing their partner's career. And I'm not seeing a lot of that reversed. Instead, there's much more a feeling, oh, we've got to do well by him, and, and there's a lot more compromises being made. Uh, in the other direction. And, and so that's a, I don't know how you deal with that one. That's a real issue. Shelley, I'd like to pick up on your comment before that the, the executives and universities will go aware of this issue of economics. Um, I'm one of those guys who seems like a play in the past, it's a military and the information technology industry more recently in my economist. When I was at HP, Back out of the United States, I was I worked in the 40th century. The, in 1980, in the mid 1980s, we recognised the issue of, of lack of diversity and basically wasted resources with often highly educated women coming in and in positions like secretaries and stuff like this. So they brought in, in a, an affirmative action program to basically initially put. Uh, from more, more women into, into middle management. And by 1996, Carly Fiorina was the CEO, right? and, and she's recently been one of the candidates for, for president. Quite a turnaround. Yeah. Why haven't, why hasn't, you know, universities supposed to be educated, they know that diversity works, they teach organisational behaviour, they know that women communicate, why haven't the universities done something about this? And I think what we've been able to see is universities trying to pressure economics departments, right? But I think there's been a certain reluctance to strong arm economics departments. And so what I see a lot of is economics departments learning to talk the talk and not actually do anything. And uh, <laughs> that appears to be a very common response to um, uh, the university coming down on a department and saying, come on, you know, it's been 10 years, surely you could fire, find some woman you're willing to hire. Um, and, and I think there's been a reluctance on the part of university administrations to really take stronger action, to refuse to, uh, I think economics departments tend to have a lot of credibility, um, and I think they have argued that there's simply nobody out there. And, uh, uh, and, and also, the whole term affirmative action is, is, is a dirty term to most economists, I think. Now, 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 my view of affirmative action is let's just stop paying attention to the process and let's look at the outcomes, right? Let's just look at the outcomes. Let's look at your hiring and your promotion decisions, and we'll judge by that what you've been doing behind it, rather than you know, allowing departments to simply say, oh, we were totally fair, and this is how we assess this person's CV, and so on. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, think I, I think I don't know university administrations well enough to know why they appear to be unwilling to take stronger action. But yeah, but the private sector is a great example of A, why it's important, and B, how to do it, if you have enough commitment to doing it. 
Oh, you're up there. <laughs> you're way up there. A very, very interesting talk. My question relates to the fact that most, most, most of this seems to be about this trajectory of PhD, early career researcher, and then moving forward. And the lived experience that I have, and many other women that I know who are former academics have, is that we start out there, we then end up in either the casual lecture or track, or we end up being taken off for short term contracts. Eventually, we leave that world to go into consultancy or not profit or government departments. And then at some point, we do wish to come back to academia. And so my question really is, how do we then make this space more inviting for women to return after perhaps a period of time when they would not have been as productive as their male cohorts? So many questions I don't know how to answer. Um, <coughs> that's another, a, a very important question. It is really hard to get back on the academic track. In the, U, in the US, it's almost impossible. Um, and I think part of it is that rigid timing. If you don't have tenure, after X years out from a PhD, it's really difficult to, uh, uh, to stay on or come back onto the academic track. My understanding is there's a lot more flexibility in, in non-US systems to do that. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know, but I, but I think what you've highlighted is, is sort of the rigidities of this process that mesh very poorly with women's life cycles if they have children. And, um, and it's a really important point and, uh, and a difficult one. And it's sort of related to this whole, you know, uh, tenure clock extension policy is there's this fundamental asymmetry in how the average man and woman deals with family responsibilities. And somehow our personnel decisions have to reflect that and not just pretend it's not there. Right, or that we can just you know abstract from it, and 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 this is another example of exactly how that how that works. Shall I get it right at the back now? <laughs> uh, thanks, Shelley. Um, John Escudero from uh, the Melbourne Institute. Um, I think your points are very well taken with respect to academic couples and the sort of the um, leader follower uh, model being. Uh, particular issue for, for women, uh, especially in attracting uh, um, high quality women. Also, I think the, um, the what I've seen in sort of uh, promotions and hiring committees is uh, effectively one type of male and two types of female. Um, upon uh, submission for uh, promotion or, or hiring, it seems as if the male um, meets all the criteria. And the female, there's two types of female. There's, a, there's one type of female that just nails it, just blows away everyone by all the indicators. And then there's another type of female that uh, is really shaky. And it's not clear what type of, uh, um, if this person's going to make the, the pr promotion criteria. And it seems to me that um, people are getting uh, either signals very late or getting wrong signals about when is the right time to go up for promotion under what circumstances. It seems like the men are all very well connected and uh, some of the women seem to be very well connected um, or are just sort of hyper achievers that will not, you know, take the risk of being embarrassed by not uh, uh, getting the promotion that they've gone up for. And then there's a whole bunch of women who are completely out of the loop it seems, with respect to um, what they need to, to get promoted. So th I think there's a real mentoring failure here in, in terms of, uh, of protecting these women that are going effectively, uh, you know, it's like a salamander into the fire. Uh, they, they don't have a chance, but it's just bad mentoring across the board. I, that's, a, that's a really useful point. It's, it's, you have more experience with this than I have at the, at the committee level. But I, but I think what you're pointing out is this is an information problem, right? It's, it's their senior colleagues have fallen down on the job. For both of them, for both of those types of women. One is the kind, like when I went up for promotion to full, I was absurdly overqualified by that point, right? But it's just, I, you know, I wasn't going to push to get brought up until it was a slam dunk. And, um, and so this is what you're describing. And so in both cases, they're just not getting the intelligence. They're not getting the inside dope that they need. And, and that's a, just a straight department problem, as you point out. That's just a failure on the part of the department to ensure effective mentoring for, uh, for junior women. That's a, an excellent point.
Okay, we have one more question from our back row rebels. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Renee Kanaki from the University of Houston, and I'm also here at RMTM Fulbright. And I found your talk fascinating. I have to confess, I'm not an economist. I am a law professor. Although, had I been mentored by many of you in this room, I might have not just had a econ for my undergraduate, but um, got my PhD. My question for you is this, and I hope I'm calling it the right thing here in Australia, but in the United States, we have observed the impact of the Me Too movement on the way that women are mentored in all fields. And I was really struck by your comment, uh, making a distinction between gender hostility versus uh, sexual discrimination or sexual misconduct. And I, I think there are two pieces here. One, we now see men saying, oh, I'm not going to mentor women because I don't want to be a part of the Me Too movement fallout. But then also thinking, oh, I'm not part of the problem because I haven't been engaging in sexual harassment or sexual misconduct. And these other issues related to your point, um, gender hostility, get completely set aside. And I wonder if you might comment on that just a bit further. Um, boy. I confess that the response to the Me Too movement that goes along the lines of I am so frightened of being falsely accused of sexual harassment that I'm not going to have anything to do with women. I'm not going to mentor female graduate students. I'm not going to mentor female finance professionals. I'm just going to forget that it makes me so angry because it's so stupid. It's so, I always feel like yelling at guys who say, this is so stupid. The number of false accusations is minuscule, and it's another example of a mental health problem. I mean, the people who might accuse you falsely of sexual harassment are the same, you know, uh, disgruntled grad students who are going to accuse you of, um, you know, uh, faking your data in your paper. It's the same kind of issue. <clears throat> it's just not an essential part of Me Too or sexual harassment or whatever. It's just there's a few crazies out there. You probably won't run into one of them. Um, that it just, and, and you know, I face this in my institution, people who respond to this by saying in class, you know, gee, Roland Fryer is getting investigated for, you know, uh, gender misconduct in his lab, and so I think I probably shouldn't have women in my graduate class anymore, right, which is gender hostility of the, of the first order. Um, it just makes me furious, and I don't even know if I can say anything more sensible than that. But <laughs> shut up, guys! For God's sake, shut up! Sorry, that wasn't very productive. <laughs> I think that was the last question. <laughs> well, it's wonderful to finish on that. Thank you for that afternoon. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, and given um, Shelley's focus on what works, um, we have hopefully a fitting gift, which is a copy of Iris Bonnet's What Works, oh, in terms right. of improving gender balance. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. Excellent. <laughs> on behalf of the workshop and the Economics Network. And I also just did want to take this opportunity um, to, to do a bit of a plug for the activities of the network, which tied in very nicely with some of um, Shelley's ideas or evidence base about what actually can help change these things. Uh, so in terms of reshaping the opinion of, of young women in high school as to what an economist looks like, um, if you haven't seen it, please check out our economics video, which features um, you know, lots of real-life economists in different sectors talking about what they do and showing them that economics isn't just about, some of them are here, that's right, it's not just about numbers and finance, it's about you know, health policy and environmental policy and all of those things. Um, and if you know any teachers, get them to show it to their students in their class. Uh, second of all, we do have a mentoring program focusing on junior and mid-career women. Um, it is uh, broader than just academics, so we invite um, you know, women to apply from government and the private sector. Um, again, some women here that have been part of that program, and it, it's just a fantastic two days. And I know everyone leaves feeling extremely inspired. Um, so that will be held in October this year, so please look out for that on the Women in Economics website if that's something that you think you might be interested in participating in. Um, so once again, thank you everyone for coming along to the workshop, and you know, I hope... Everyone has a fantastic and inspiring couple of days. Thank you.